Over the short history of this country, the free press has traditionally operated independent of the government. Their stories can easily be identified as standing apart from the war marketing rhetoric fed to us by our government. This creates diversity in media content and allows for a healthy democracy consisting of informed citizens. During World War II, however, the lines between journalism and marketing were quite fuzzy. This was the environment in which Norman Hatch, a Marine Corps cinematographer, learned his craft, deployed to war, and captivated the world with his raw images of combat. Norman Hatch was trained in the art of cinematography for the express purpose of creating positive stories for the nation and cultivating a patriotic attitude towards the Marine Corps. At a time when the differences between journalism and marketing were virtually indistinguishable, however, Hatch's public relations efforts quickly turned into news. Although Hatch's news boosted patriotism, it also stunted enlistment numbers due to its accurate portrayal of the consequences of war. The free press is a necessary facet of a democracy, serving as a watchdog of the government and holding those in power to a high degree of accountability. The reason for the free press being called the free press is because it does not accept money or rules from the government. This allows the press to publish stories like the one that exposed the Watergate scandal, or the story by the Boston Globe that exposed the systematic cover-up of child molestation by the Catholic Church, or the New York Times articles that exposed the surveillance abuse of the NSA leaked by Edward Snowden. As you can see, the free press clearly stands independent of the government yet it always is in the best interest of the democracy. Marketing, on the other hand, is biased towards the organization that created it. Although still useful in a democracy, it cannot be trusted to provide one with the truth, as marketing is deceitful by nature. I'll admit that Uncle Sam looks pretty trustworthy, but he definitely has an agenda. All marketing has an agenda, from Olive Garden to Nike to recruitment posters. During wartime, it's pretty easy to spot government marketing. It pops up everywhere. During World War II, however, it wasn't so easy to decipher what was journalism and what was government marketing. Due to the nature of the total war, the existence of a very clear and dangerous enemy, the rallying of the country behind our boys, and the invention of new photographic and cinematic technologies, the industries of journalism and marketing were essentially tied together in an effort to both educate the public and bolster patriotism. You can see the roots of this partnership in the two-decade-long relationship between Hollywood and the military. The military would provide resources to Hollywood in exchange for the production of positive content. By the height of World War II, this limited relationship grew into a very real, yet unofficial partnership between the press and the government. The military employed hundreds of photographers and cinematographers. They realized that there were only a handful of individuals in the world who could create epic motion pictures. This led them to commission into the military names like Frank Capra, director of It's a Wonderful Life, and John Huston, director of Moulin Rouge. Remember, this was in an effort to create content that would inspire patriotism and favorably market the government and the war effort. Imagine that. That's like the U.S. Army coming to Steven Spielberg and Quentin Tarantino and asking them to join the armed forces to make pro-army movies in the middle of Afghanistan. This created an environment during World War II in which there were photographers, cinematographers, and writers working for the military while there were just as many who continued to work for the private sector. The interesting thing is both parties produced content that had the same patriotic pro-American flavor. When it came time for papers like the New York Times to publish articles, they didn't have to exclusively choose stories written by their own correspondents. They could choose stories written by correspondents working for the military. These stories became known as Joe Blow stories, and local papers loved to feature articles written about their own hometown heroes, regardless of what organization the author of the story worked for. Norman Hatch was among the group of individuals who were enlisted as military personnel. He learned his craft in New York City and traveled with the Marines as they made their way towards Japan. He led the Marine cinematographers as they documented one of the largest beach assaults in history, D-Day at Tarawa. He captured the carnage, the bloodshed, and the deaths of thousands of Marines. Less than a year later, the footage was edited into a 20-minute film and approved for release by the president, FDR. All of the major cinema news companies played Hatch's film. 
It was a film designed to rally support for the war effort, yet was played by private media companies. Furthermore, due to the graphic portrayal of combat, it caused enlistment numbers to go down. Now, I'm not an expert in marketing, but I'm pretty certain that organizations want their marketing campaigns to send their numbers up, not down. So, was Hatch's film a marketing campaign? Was it news? I don't know. That's for you to decide.